So, well, thanks so much for taking the time Absolutely, um, to thank sit you. down with us to talk about Antones. Um, we were just talking before, and I've done this as a bit of a prequel to all of these um, interviews, just in case people watch them in isolation. So, we um, at Loud Hiller, we're doing a trip across the country. Um, to speak to independent venue owners, we're hitting 10 different cities. Um, the driver behind the trip was, was really um, a conversation that I had with, with National Independent Venues Association during COVID, which shocked me in terms of how many venues might have gone out of business um, during that period without the federal assistance that, that NEVA ultimately helped them get. Um, and we're also trying to you know, generate a bit of money for the National Independent Venues Foundation, generate a bit of awareness about why independent venues are so important in the music ecosystem, um, and also gather some money for musicians on call if we can. Um, so to start off with, um, I did want to talk about you a little bit, your, your corner of, of this, which is a very historic venue um, in Antones, in Antones, in Austin. Um, how did that come about? What, what drove you to, to get involved? So I'm from Austin originally, yeah. grew up here. Um, my dad uh, grew up in Austin as well. And, you know, we're a music town. Um, there's a lot of live music to go to yeah. growing up, events, little festivals, uh, you know, record in store, skate shop in store. So music was just kind of a part of my life as a kid. And um, my dad uh, was a doctor his whole career, actually, but he mm. played guitar and uh, blues guitar and harmonica, you know, as a hobby. Yeah. And he had actually been really into uh, the blues um, kind of while he was growing up, um, which, which I'll kind of maybe circle back on later. But when yeah. I was a kid, I was kind of into whatever type of music and um, started playing music at a young age, you know, my sister was eight years older than me, she was a real accomplished pianist, so uh, we had a piano in the house. Actually, that Baldwin Acrosonic yeah. <laughs> used to be in our house. Yeah. That has made its rounds. It was in Nashville for about <laughs> 20 years and then came back uh, here, it was over at Arlen Studios where yeah. I'm a partner, Willie Nelson's old studio, and then uh, finally now in the Antone's Green Room. But, uh, and so I kind of learned all the garage band instruments, drums, bass, yeah. guitar, and uh, played music in little, you know, crappy garage bands growing up and all that. Um, kind of got on the production side. Uh, I was doing uh, some DJing and production and promotion. And uh, to be honest, uh, one of the turning points for me was uh, going to Austin High, yeah. our public school here. And, um, uh, Jake Andrews was a year ahead of me, and he still plays at the club. Yeah. Uh, Guitar Jake, you know, it's his nickname um, growing up because he got to play with all the greats when he was a young kid. He was a blues guitar phenom. And not many people know this story, but Jake graduated. You know, he was so cool. He'd walk into class. He'd still be wearing, like, his show clothes from the night before, kind of walk in late. Yeah. You know, no books, <laughs> nothing. And we'd just be like, wow, you know, his kind of boots kind of jingling as he goes. Yeah. And uh, when he graduated, I, I thought, okay, um, don't have to, you know, hide under Jake Andrew's shadow anymore. I can, it's my time to shine, you know, because yeah. I was, uh, had been um, kind of establishing my, uh, self as a blues guitar player, self, myself kind of blues rock, whatever. And right about that time, I heard about a freshman named Gary Clark. <laughs> and uh, I saw him play. Yeah. And I, uh, I thought, oh, man, uh, I don't know that I, I can't compete with that, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I reassessed my role in the village, as I like to say. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's Gary Clark Jr., of yeah, course, yeah, who's actually sure. my partner here in the yeah, club. Yeah. And um, I still play for fun. I still, uh, you know, enjoy that part of music. But what I learned is, um, you know, I, what I, what I, I kind of found my passion. I became kind of uh, focused on infrastructure. You know, what are we lacking in Austin that musicians need in order for Austin to become 
a town that musicians feel like they can be successful, you yeah. know? Um, and I also got mo more focused on uh, the production side and I got, uh, I'd always been interested in, you know, the show ever since I was a little kid, you know, at a wedding or a Christmas party, I would make friends with the sound guy, I'd yeah. make friends with the tour manager, you know, I'd make, I'd go talk to the band at the break. I didn't just want to be, um, part of the audience. Like I wanted audience to kind of, I, yeah, I always wanted to be like a part of the show. I think that's natural for a lot of people, you know, yeah. especially people that get into, um, you know, service. I, I feel like, uh, especially this world of pr presenting live shows is very similar to the hospitality world. Cause yeah. I grew up doing that as well. You know, Austin's a big, um, yeah. food and beverage town. So I started doing catering jobs at, with my brother, uh, for, barbecue restaurant he was working at since I was 10 and kind of worked in service um, growing up as well. And, and you're and, involved, and, you, you co-own a barbecue restaurant as well now. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, my first project um, ever on our own was partnering with uh, one of my other friends from high school, yeah. Larry McGuire, who's now uh, has, a, he and my, our other partner, Tom Mormon, have a hospitality empire, empire, MML hospitality, you know, 20, plus restaurants, but we started Lambert's together 16 years ago uh, because we just had this simple idea of doing, you know, elevated barbecue, kind of the food we grew up loving, but yeah. with a music component. Um, so yeah, hospitality, service, live music, all very intertwined uh, in Austin. And it's just kind of a part of our, you know, day-to-day -day life, you know, the same reason people like going to get yeah. good food or go to the, go to a bar, to, you know, just to, it's like music wasn't something that you had to get the big ticket and go yeah. to the big show. It was very kind of uh, casual. Yeah. We call ourselves the live music capital of the world. And if we are, it's on volume, not yeah. on. Um, Huge. <laughs> yeah, we are actually, as we've become a more sophisticated and established market for touring, now we do have some larger venues and we're getting more of those shows. But for the longest time, um, you know, Austin was just this kind of small club town yeah. and we pride ourselves in that. Yeah. Um, we, we have a strong small club scene and, uh, you know, there's two terms that are near and dear to my heart and our heart here in Austin. And that is the word club and yeah. the word scene. Um, I call them terms of endearment because, uh, all clubs are venues, but not all venues are clubs. You know, yeah. club means something special to us, at least. A club means it has a face, it has a personality, there's integrity to what's being presented, there's continuity and consistency. You can't just be dark yeah. three or four days a week because you don't have a show. If a headliner cancels on you, you get on the phone and you figure out something to do. Yeah. Uh, you're almost more like a bar with music, yeah, you yeah. know? Um, and scene, of course, is the most elusive of everything. Yeah, scene is you can't uh you can't describe how to create it uh if you try to you know capture it it escapes it's yeah. uh this really kind of mysterious elusive thing but we feel so fortunate that we still have a scene yeah. and a, because unfortunately in a you know a lot of other cities around the country and around the world um that's kind of dissipated or evaporated so anyway to finally get to your yeah, question yeah. Uh, I just grew up kind of being exposed to all of it and it kind of and always gravitating towards it and it felt kind of natural and intuitive to me yeah. and so as I was getting our start in hospitality and um, you know restaurant stuff and you know Lambert's being my first venue um, this opportunity came along several years later uh, you know a lot of people don't realize but Anton's um, this is the sixth location in its 48 year history. Yeah, I was looking at the history, it's jumped all over. Austin. And, and that's really unique too. Yeah. Uh, you know, most venues, especially at least, uh, you know, an Austin music venue history, they have their life, their run. Yeah. And, uh, after that, you know, another one pops up yeah. and the ones that have been around for a while, we mourn the loss of, yeah. or, or maybe we try and preserve them and save them. I call it kind of like trees in the forest, yeah. you know, but it's inevitable. There's a life cycle, yeah. they die, and then another seed is planted. Yeah. And uh, Clifford didn't get the memo on that. <laughs> no. um, 
it was it was uh, absolutely in part due to his tenacity and uh, his <laughs> obsession really with um, presenting the blues specifically blues artists that he considered to be the progenitors of the the genre and the art form and he felt like it was this you know the the clock was ticking he only had so much time to present these folks and try and give them their their uh you know their fair uh exposure to the to the world to to try and um pass it on you know music and especially um roots genres like the blues you can't pass them on just with cheap music yeah you gotta see and those folks didn't even you know obviously yeah, didn't, didn't use they're, they're it. Just, no, they're uh, it, and, it's 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 kind of a kind of like a spoken yeah um history uh that has to be seen in person so uh he was uh fanatical about it and so the show all the show must go on yeah. and the and the the music had to it, the work had to be yeah. done there just wasn't another way so Antones would pop around it, it would get re-ball. displaced from one place <laughs> and no problem he'd, we'd, he'd go to the other place so uh, in 2014 I believe Clifford passed away sadly yeah. in 2006 his sister Susan Antone took over the club she's still involved with us yeah. here today um, uh, it actually got sold to another club owner at, uh, at one point and and moved to another location and it just wasn't working it kind of lost its way it kind of lost its blues kind of uh focus and yeah. more importantly kind of its blues kind of center of origin yeah. and so uh talk about coming full circle you know clifford um had an impact on myself getting yeah. to my dad because he was a blues fan used to take me to antones and expose me to that music at a young age yeah. you know way before we were supposed to <laughs> supposed to be in there and I can remember meeting Clifford and um, I only sadly really only interacted with him kind of as an adolescent I never had a you know an adult uh, relationship with him Um, but he made an impact and had an influence on me and a lot of people in this town Gary being another uh, one of those uh, Zach Ernst our talent buyer uh, being another person Clifford actually taught some classes at University of Texas back in the day and um, that was pretty cool uh, people that got to yeah, be there for that it, yeah. and so um, all of a sudden the kind of word on the street was that you know Antones was being sold and um, I call ourselves the kids table this little uh, group of my peers uh, similar in age where we were all influenced heavily by Clifford and you know we're always looking up at our mentors and all the people that were around Clifford uh, in that era and so we start calling around and sort of prophesizing about well who's gonna save it who's gonna jump in you know is it gonna be you know Jimmy Vaughn you know or somebody from his crew or is it gonna be Steve Wertheimer from Continental Club and Sea Boys and we start talking to some of those uh, you know, the, our, our mentors, our uh, kind of, uh, le- you know, senior leadership of yeah. the music community, and they kind of said, oh, you know what, I don't know, We're, we, we might be, you know, getting too old to do that, but maybe y'all should do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was this kind of, we're not worthy <laughs> yeah, yeah. moment of being handed the torch, and it was an incredible incredibly intimidating, and a, it felt like this huge responsibility. I can remember just you know stewing on it for weeks and months but there was we didn't have a choice we 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 all collectively kind of said we don't want to live in a town uh without antones it's it's not just antones but it's it's like what symbolically it meant that 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 popping around that refusal to end um i think is very symbolic of kind of the the heartbeat and spirit of the the austin club uh, culture yeah and so uh, where we stand today is actually that sixth location we we brought it here oh, you brought so what you weren't here when you came on board that's you correct moved well it, it, it was kind of in between okay. homes because of ah, that okay, it that was, sale yeah. and so we felt like it was important 
uh, and it had actually wandered a little bit outside of what's considered, you know, core downtown. Yeah. So we thought it was important to bring it back downtown as close to the original uh, cross streets as possible, Six and Brazos, which is just about kind of two blocks yeah. uh, that way. And we felt it was important to make it a club again. So yeah. scale wise, we actually kind of scaled it down uh, to a smaller space. And yeah, that was, uh, we opened in 2015. So it's crazy how it's, time flies. It's couple of things you said there it's interesting I've interviewed probably four or five different venue owners now on this trip maybe three or four and there are there are different things that come up consistently one thing that you said was was you know just having to be consistent there having to be a place that people know is going to be open however many nights a week and artists know they can play there that was what we were in um, Clarksdale on the last stop Mississippi and we were at Grand Zero Blues Bar and and you know that's what they said and and again uh, thank goodness for people like clifford and and in clarksdale it was you know bill luckett who i think was the mayor at the time and and morgan freeman actually opened ground zero exactly the same reason they were like people need somewhere that they know is going to be open like five nights a week whatever mm -hmm. it is and and on the on the other side of things prior to that we were in florence and i felt super old because I was talking to a couple of guys who've just opened a music venue there called For The Record. It, it always surprised me in Florence when I went there, being in Alabama in the Muscle Shoals, that that town didn't have, didn't seem to have a dedicated, you know, live music venue. And these two guys have opened it, they're 25 and 26 years old, but they said the same thing. When they opened it, they wanted it to be open six nights a week. So people knew, even if there's not live music on, come to the bar come and play like they've got Mario Kart set up out the back yeah. and things like that. But it's consistency was one thing. And then just that passion for, which was just what I heard out, out of Clarksdale as well when I talked to the people there, that passion for with something like the blues, keeping that alive and kind of fostering and, and incubating the next generation of those musicians, right? And, and I think it's just yeah. the same with Anton's. You had, I mean, you've already talked about some of them, but obviously one of my heroes like Stevie Ray Vaughan, right? He mm. cut his teeth here, at, or like Ed Antunes as well. And that's another important attribute of a club, I think is mm. most clubs, most noteworthy clubs, usually have some kind of genre focus or style focus that is kind of associated with their brand and their yeah. culture. Doesn't mean they can't present music outside of that, but it is kind of 
a perspective or a lens, as I like to say. So everything we present, and we have all types of music. Yeah. I mean, everything you can imagine, pop music, rap yeah. music, metal, lots of indie bands. Yeah. We, we like to present, you know, as the, much diversity as possible. Um, but there's this perspective uh, of it coming from the blues and yeah. kind of an artist play to that, you know, they yeah. might come up with the, you know, the one blues cover for their yeah. encore or, you know, it's cool. It, it gives it, 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 the scariest thing, you know, to an artist sometimes is the blank canvas, yeah. no context, no. Yeah. And uh, so what's cool about old clubs is it, is it, it gives you something um, to kind of play off of, yeah, yeah. you know, so with Anton's, it's obviously, uh, that history. Yeah, it really does. It has a vibe, I mean, like as well. And, and obviously all the art and the photos and Muddy's on the wall, a huge de picture downstairs. You've got all of the, the pictures of artists who've played here. It's, <clears throat> it really gives it its own. It, I mean, it, it's a real nice nod to the history of the place, I think. It's, mm -hmm. it, which... And that Muddy mural, um, by the way, is a real kind of, uh, um, you know, kind of, badge of honor so to speak or you know kind of one of our battle scars um we during the pandemic which i'm kind of you know sick of you know totally. talking about but i know there's some underlying context yeah. here because of uh neva of yeah. course and what inspired you to go on this trip um when everything was shutting downtown downtown in austin mm. uh a general contractor buddy of mine said hey we're down here we're boarding up all the windows you know my crew's out do you want me to board up antones and i said yeah. absolutely not yeah. you know i don't like the um message that sends yeah. i don't like the optics of that boarding it up like we're fearful yeah. uh you know because some places were getting broken into and people things were getting a little restless yeah. uh, downtown and uh about an hour later one of our other restaurants uh got a call somebody had just thrown a brick through the storefront yeah you know people were just frustrated things mm -hmm. were a little um unhinged and i said okay gosh yeah go ahead board up the front of antones geez i don't want yeah. you know so it looked just terrible it didn't it looked so stark and cold and yeah. just like shuttered and so we hired a couple local artists uh, uh famous graffiti artists and another artist that um, does a lot of um paints to music and shows and things yeah. anyway um we said can you do a mural in front of uh, the club and then another graphic artist we worked with came up with that concept of he, we called it muddy jesus because yeah, yeah. that's actually yeah, not muddy's me. hands that's yeah. actually uh the hands of jesus from the famous you know one, um, one of the famous um statues yeah. anyway if you look at it you can kind of tell oh yeah <laughs> that's not muddy's hands muddy um you can see pictures of him up here he was yeah. a fixture in the club uh the old antones crew referred to him as uncle muddy because they had a really tight bond with him they were close with you know a lot of those um you know legends yeah. from chicago and new orleans and louisiana and stuff but buddy i think uh he kind of have was almost like a father figure you know looking after yeah. that younger class and anyway, to me, it was beautiful. I mean, it was just kind of this, everything is gonna be all right. Yeah. And so when it was finally time to open back up, we, we, gotta put it, we yeah, yeah we, we couldn't <laughs> throw it in the dumpster. It was too, yeah. so where are we gonna put that? So, you know, now it's stage left on, in, our, in our venue. And it looks, and I'm gonna, I, yeah, I'm and I'm trying not to bring everyone back to like the worst bits of, like, like what I'm gonna take out of, of the COVID experience was, People, people adapted, right? And I think, I mean, obviously we're doing this for, for the Independent Venues Foundation and, and they, were, they only came about because of COVID, but it, it was devastating at the time for, for live music venues and things like that. But, but also at the same time, you saw musicians and then you saw, saw venues sort of pivot to do different things like parking lot. I mean, ultimately people did some parking lot concerts, they did live streams, things like that. And I, I mean, how did you find the experience? Did, did Antones do, do go into live streaming or, or doing anything? We did a little bit of everything, but 
none of it was, you know, significant or was any it's not live music experience. viable not, yeah. alternative. Um, yeah, so, you know, we tried to, um, it was more so to help other mm. musicians and things. So if people needed a space to live stream, yeah. um, we, uh, there wasn't much you could do here, you know, if, if you were a, a restaurant or you had a kitchen, you know, there were some places that were able to kind of open up and yeah. do some, but it just, you know, even at a 400 capacity venue, which is yeah. still considered very small, it wasn't, there wasn't anything really viable we could do yeah. inside for a long time. Um, so we tried to, um, we have a nonprofit, uh, it's kind of sister company, the okay. Clifford Anton Foundation. Yeah. And so um, we actually just, we're trying to raise funds on social media and we did so pretty successfully and we were just uh, kind of sending micro grants to what we consider kind of, you know, the Antones extended yeah. family, all the artists that, you know, you don't really think of it as being like an employer of yeah. artists because it's contract work yeah. and it's gigs and whatever, but, but we are, I mean, yeah. we are, you know, we have more musician employees than we have uh, music industry professional yeah. employees and when you look at the numbers I mean obviously the f most of our our biggest expense our biggest uh, is we buy music we yeah. pay musicians and um, so that was uh, kind of our focus and yeah. it felt good to be able to just use you know yeah. our channel our network to uh, yeah. raise funds and just try and it was need based, you know, there were so many grants and a lot of obviously a lot of support that ended yeah. up being really helpful. But there were some tricky moments there, especially kind of in the beginning where it, things weren't happening fast yeah, yeah. enough. And, you know, 300 bucks, 500 bucks could be the difference of somebody, you know, losing their car or losing their apartment yeah. or losing. So um, it was just kind of trying to stick the little band-aids and yeah. stick the, you know, fingers in the... Yeah, pulling no. the dam kind of thing to, yeah. uh, until more support came. And it, it was, um, and obviously that support came in, in the context of, which is amazing in, in the US today, like, you know, there was pretty much bipartisan support for that, that, that funding that came. And then what, what I took out of it, and, and obviously uh, me and, and Kirsting, like we run a music website, it's a huge part of what we do day to day. So we're at live music all the time. But, but anyone who goes to live music, I mean, being kept away from it, it really, um, you know, it, it just goes as a fan to show how important it is in everyone's life and how important mm -hmm. these venues are in everyone's life. And I know we were just talking before this and, and I said, like, when I first walked into the venue downstairs this time, this is the first time I've been back since, I, I don't know when everything fully opened up after COVID, like 21. We were here in this summer of, and, and effectively, we were doing a trip to Austin anyway, just as a vacation kind of thing, a drive and, and through Texas. And um, it just happened that uh, Lucas Nelson was playing a warm-up show for his, his tour. And, and we found out before we came, and, and Kirst got in touch and, with his publicist and said, can I shoot the show? The website, yeah, no problem. And we came, and, um, and that was my first live show after... 18 months of no live music and it was like I, I don't you know I'm from the northeast of England I try not to get too like fluffy about stuff but but honestly uh, in that room that night and, and you it's funny that you said exactly the same thing he closed with diamonds in the soles of my shoes by that, that Paul Simon cover and I was stood in the middle of the room and there was a girl um, with her husband who was actually in a wheelchair and she was dancing with him and everyone was dancing and the whole room was and, and I had like walked to the side because I had tears in my eyes. Honestly, oh, I've yeah. missed it so much. It was, it was unbelievable. Well, and I think this is a good segue into, you know, why is music so important and therefore why are these venues so important and why are independent mm -hmm. venues so important and why did it garner that support? Yeah. You know, um, music is it's it's the most prominent most mainstream most commercial also art form yeah 
right? It's um, arguably one of the most kind of uh, primitive and kind of early uh, art forms too in terms of, you know, um, I mean, animals are known to yeah. kind of make certain kind of music almost. It's a, it's a communication yeah. tool. Uh, but most people that aren't in the business or aren't, you know, they don't, they enjoy it. They don't understand it. It's kind of, kind of almost this fringe kind of culture, you know, it's not being a lawyer or a doctor. It's if you yeah. tell your parents you're going to be a musician, they're kind of, oh gosh. Oh, no, yeah, you well, do you something know? serious at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like we don't take it serious. We probably take it for granted. We yeah. were probably most definitely taking it for granted more so before definitely. the pandemic. Yeah. But um, it's part of our, we, we just like we eat food and yeah you know, breathe there. It's something that we consume yeah. uh, kind of without even realizing it, yeah. uh, you know, walking down the grocery store aisle or yeah. in your car or whatever. So it's this universal language, as people say, it sounds almost kind of cliche, yeah. but uh, yeah, being deprived of that was the worst part, you know, it was depressing. And um, so I think we learned, I think we did gain a greater appreciation for the art form, uh, for what the power of yeah. healing and power of connection and power of feeling alive. Um, those of us, I think, uh, those of us that are involved with it got a greater appreciation for our jobs. I mean, you know, it just, it made us feel like, wow, what we're, this is, how lucky are we to be able to do this? and that drove us even more to get back to, yeah. you know, it was just like everybody just wanted to be able to get back to what yeah. they were doing. And even though it's a, also can be a hard job and a hard industry, very much so, we all felt like, wow, I'm going to be, I'm, we're not going to take it for granted either. Yeah. If we can just get back to doing it again, then, you know, we'll be so content. So, yeah, I think that was kind of amazing that it was able to garner that universal support because all types of industries were hurting. Yeah. Um, I also feel like it was maybe kind of making up for some lost time. You look at venues across the country and infrastructure across the country and kind of also also little stats and factoids like, you know, the, the average cover charge in Austin had not gone up in 20 years yeah. or something, you know, because it was still kind of this $5, $10 yeah, yeah, out of your pocket thing your wallet, for, yeah. for local club shows. Um, so it allowed uh, venues to not just fill some of the holes from the, the pandemic, but kind of like prepare for a brighter future, get that new air conditioning unit, get that yeah. new, fix that problem with the roof or <laughs> yeah. the stage or the sound system. It, it allowed us to uh, invest in talent operationally. It allowed us to be even more bold oper uh, investing yeah. in the talent that we present. And so, uh, particularly with you know the impact Neva was able to make, mm. I felt like wow we are going to be, it's this is going to create a music renaissance yeah. in the United States that will probably then echo all over the world, and um, so yeah we're we're still feels like forever ago yeah but yeah as you pointed out I mean things didn't really well I have to remind our team as yeah. we're even just starting to kind of assess where we're going to end up for 2023 that 2022 was by no means a normal year yeah, it was still, it was still has year. that asterisk yeah. next to it this is the first calendar year that has been not yeah. you know encumbered by that so uh yeah it's i'm everybody's you know kind of tired of looking back but yeah. it also will it'll be a part of this story oh, forever yeah, yeah. and the silver lining is that uh, it's just like the saying goes, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. And sadly, um, a lot of people yeah. were killed. Yeah. Literally, a lot of people died. Yeah. A lot of businesses died. Um, and you'd never wish that uh, on anyone. We all wish we could just go, you know, would have yeah. hit undo and wish that could have never happened. 
But the silver lining is that those of us that did survive and the businesses that did, particularly in the arts, I feel like are more resilient stronger. and stronger than ever and have a momentum and a, a, a newfound kind of drive as yeah. to why we're doing this in the first place. And it's key, it's really key because, and that's, I think, the message that I've been trying to get across and it's been reinforced at every stop, which is, and we've kind of already spoken about it here, these venues, like independent venues, they're so important to the, to the community, for one, to musicians, because musicians need a stopping off point as they come through these towns and in the, in cities. And, and just, you know, how many new musicians will get their chance on the stage at Antones. They wouldn't get that chance if Antones wasn't here. Or, or wherever it may be, Ground Zero Blues Club in, in Clarksdale, or for the record in Florence, or wherever it may be. It, it's really important that these venues stay around. I think that's yeah. what we're, like, that's part of it. You were, you were alluding to this earlier, but mm -hmm. um, independent venues and, again, clubs, Yeah. There's uh, a great discovery element, you know, for bands because um, smaller clubs, yeah, they're going to be open every night no matter what, even yeah. if they, even if it's just a local band or if yeah. they have to fill something last minute. And so it creates these opportunities, as you said, where you're not even going there maybe for a specific band. You're just going there because you know they're going to have good yeah. live music. And so now you walk in and are exposed to something you never would have seen before. Yeah. And you know, that's powerful. Without those moments, there is, it's, it's really hard for artists to go from kind of zero to something. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, in a perfect world, every market would have this kind of stair step ecosystem of venues. You got the baby band yeah. places, you know, that's kind of another term of endearment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds kind of like a, a knock, but I yeah. mean, the baby band places no, are really, awesome. Those places, you know, because, yeah, yeah. yeah, those are the places, you know, but for those at home who don't yeah. know, that's what we call venues where it's like, you could play your first show, yeah. you know, they're kind of like, you got, okay, you say you're gonna bring 40 of your friends. Like, yeah, yeah, okay. it's a really you know? funny coming because we need to and, like- And it's up. usually a little, uh, yeah. a younger audience. There's usually lots of bands on the bill. Yeah. But uh, that's where you get your first gig and that's yeah. where you start working out. That's also where artists meet one another and collaborate. You might realize, you know what, my band sucks. Can we join, you know, yeah, maybe yeah. we should join forces yeah. or, you know, maybe I'm gonna that, steal yeah. your guitar player. And, you know, that's like, that's such an important, you know, part of the culture and the ecosystem and the, the scene. That's really where yeah. scene first cultivates from. And then as you refine and hone your, your act and you're, you're working your way up, you go to, okay, more, uh, uh, you know, more of a formal ticketed show yeah. and you sell out that place and then you just kind of keep um, going. And usually everything below, I mean, these days, um, well, most people associate independent venues with smaller rooms, right? Yeah. And so I'm, I was going to put a number on it, but it kind of varies market to market. But the higher you go, the yeah. more likely that that is not going to be an independent yeah, venue. It's, it's going to be associated yeah. with a, a corporation yeah. or a group of venues or, and you know, it's not, there's an idea out there that maybe it's kind of this yeah. fight between the two, but I'll use an analogy of say, you know, grocery stores mm. or something. I mean, big grocery stores are important uh, because yeah they're gonna get, they have the trucks and yeah. the accounts and yeah. they are gonna get um, popular and wanted produce yeah. and products all over the place. Yeah. And, um, and pr particularly in markets that maybe that's all they have, you know, yeah. but at least it's, it's something, they're at least seeing big acts and touring acts, national yeah. touring acts, regional touring acts. Um, and the independent venues are kind of like a, uh, you know, an independent um, grocery store or a farmer's market yeah. or whatever. And so, yeah, it gives uh, those farmers or those products an opportunity to kind of um, get in the mix. And so they, they, they should work yeah. hand in hand, but um, without that organic granular uh, world, it would be 
really hard for anybody to yeah get into music. And as a as a you you kind of just touched on it there, like as a fan, if you've got an independent venue, and there are lots. Of, I mean, in, in, you know, in Chicago, you've got the Metro, the Italia, all these venues. That, you can just, there are times when I'll be just like, let's just go down and see what's on. And on a particular night, you might go in that place and see the best band you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, like you say, there's nothing quite like that experience of like walking in a room, or who are these guys? And then they walk out on stage, and you're like, holy shit. Like, and then you, you know, go back, you, then you dig into all of their stuff. It's, that stuff doesn't happen without these venues. And I think it's, um, it, I mean, I think you've covered it. I, th I don't think it has to be a... You're right, it is sometimes pitched as this battle between the, the corporate ownership of venues and, and independent venues. I think they both have their place, right? Yeah. Like, like you said. Um, well, and, and this is a bit of a generalization, and it's not a knock against non-independent venues, mm. but the bigger shows you get, the more people are coming specific for that yes. band. Yeah. They're not coming because they're going to see that band whatever venue they yeah, yeah. play at, right? Yeah. They're not coming for the drinks. They're yeah. not coming for the service. Yeah. They're coming because you've got yeah. my band I yeah, want to see and that's where it is. Yeah. And so I'm... Yeah. Um, what's so cool and special and what, one of the reasons I'm passionate about presenting music is independent venues really have to build a brand, yeah. you know, for themselves. Um, so that people do are coming there for, you know, yeah. because they like the the experience, or they know you can park, or yeah. they know the you can get a great, yeah. The, yeah. They, the bars operated well, the bathrooms yeah. are clean. It's yeah. all these other little things, especially people that see live music a lot. And the ultimate goal as an independent promoter is to be able to curate yeah. and help, you know share music with folks that they might not otherwise have access to because you're bringing it, you know, you're helping create a draw or helping yeah. a, uh, create a demand or helping kind of bring that band to a new audience. Yeah. And so the ultimate goal is, and Anton's, you know, we didn't create this, Clifford did, so, yeah. so I, I remember thinking this growing up, but you see a name on the Anton's marquee that you haven't heard of, and it sparks curiosity because yeah. you think, well, if they're playing Antones, I should probably know. I haven't yeah. heard of these guys and they're, they're headlining Antones. Yeah, Maybe I should go check on. it out. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that, that is the ultimate. That is the ultimate goal as a promoter where, as an independent promoter yeah. where, you know, you can, people trust you. Yeah. And, and they say, Antones wouldn't be having this, you know, if, yeah. if it wasn't legit. So that's, yeah, yeah that's, that's the... Uh, level of quality that you know we try to uphold and it's also kind of a responsibility that we yeah. carry to maintain that because um you know your credibility is on the line yeah absolutely and yeah and the other thing we did a like a little series it's still ongoing of where we reached out to music some musicians as well and asked them about you know memories of independent venues and what was important and it was interesting because i was as we were doing a look around like your green rooms are fantastic. Like we're in one of them right now. And it's, um, it was things like that that came up, you know, like a nice space before the show. Funnily enough, a lot, like just a nice welcome from the owner. Like that, that was the things that were coming up from musicians as well, all feeding into the same thing that you're saying, right? You want to create that atmosphere for the audience who you, and the people who are your patrons who are going to come back, but also for the musicians who are going to come through here, right? They're mm -hmm. like, oh man, I played Anton's the other week. It was amazing. Those guys are so nice when I got there. It was easy, like loading was easy. They were there to greet me. Like, it's just the same kind of thing. And, and it's I mean, all those things. And, yeah. and we love our audience and our customers yeah. and our ticket buyers, our fans. Um, and we cater to them and we yeah. want their experience. We focus a lot on their experience, but we focus on the artist's experience first. Yeah. yeah. You know, I always, uh, I used to tell my restaurant partners this because, you know, it's, especially having music at a restaurant. It's crazy sometimes because the food, every day it's the same menu and consistent and, yeah. and they're trying, and, but the band comes in and yeah. you don't know, you know, they're gonna maybe play a different type of music or maybe yeah. they're feeling a little different that day. And I would tell my chef partners, I'd be like, guys, it's kind of like if you had a new kitchen team come in every <laughs> yeah, night every and you're just hoping they're in a good mood, yeah, yeah. you would be tripping over yourself to yeah. greet them and make sure they've got all the equipment they want yeah. because if they don't, 
guess what? The food's not going to be very good. Yeah. So um, I'm super proud of our team here. I mean, super proud. Um, that was another thing. You know, the pandemic um, brought us together um, and just kind of fortified our team here. And we were able to keep our entire yeah. um, core team yeah, together. Absolutely. And um, we have, you know, I'm not patting my self on the back these are uh this is compliments we hear from artist teams that are going all around the country and playing similar size clubs but they gush over us because it's all those little details summated everything from you know the the flight to the yeah to the hotel to the venue um and yeah we try and make that you know we put a lot of passion into it. it's not just okay, it's showtime, you know, Yeah. it's like, to us, it's, it's that entire, um, uh, it's that entire experience yeah. curating that, you know, for the artist, um, making them feel special and giving them a platform to, to elevate the art. And we're, we're a saturated kind of town in Austin yeah. because we have so many clubs. So we like to punch above our weight class. You know, yeah. we, we're an underplay venue we're only a 400 cap venue but we're kind of known for having artists that you get big yeah, are used to really playing do, yeah. bigger so our green rooms are disproportionately large <laughs> yeah. for the size of our capacity and our sound system and lighting system are yeah. uh you know a little above average above the norm for a room this size but yeah. but that's that's our passion at the end of the day we want to be the best 400 cap club in the world and I, I dare say that on a good day, I think we're uh, we're at least rivaling I for. Mean, I uh, think you're right up there. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, from my and it, uh, it, that one exit, and like I say, it will the, Anton's will forever be burned into my mind now for that just for being here for that show. That was magical and yeah. spiritual, and yeah. Lucas is a good friend and a good friend of the club and obviously uh comes from good stock <laughs> yeah and uh he was channeling something that night it that awesome. uh we all felt yeah. and yeah i'll never forget that no, night either neither. well thanks so much for taking the time i know you're busy i really appreciate it absolutely yeah. thank you all for doing this uh safe travels on the thank rest you of your much. voyage and um yeah i hope to get hope you get to catch some great uh, some more great music. Yeah, we were. Yeah, going to be. We're going to be here tonight for Chris Shifflett okay. and and cover that show. So we'll put a review of the show up on the website, and then, yeah, we've got we've got three more. Three more stops, I think, in cities. So we're going to be in. Um, we're going to be in Santa Fe, then we're going to be in Phoenix, and then LA. Well, and this won't air until I'm, I'm sure until at least after October, right? Two so. or three days. We should. We're pretty good. We're getting back and then editing stuff. So hopefully we'll have it up on the site within two or three days. Okay, cool. Well, shameless mm. plug. Yeah. Um, we did a little another thing uh, special this year. Yeah. Um, that during the pandemic, in fact, we were kind of thinking of okay, when we're back, you know, what are our goals? And yeah. and something we had talked about for a long time was taking the interns' experience outside of our four walls. Yeah. In uh, 1999 and 2000, Clifford threw uh, Antone's Blues Festival at yeah. Waterloo Park here in Austin, and that was pop-up stages and kind of a you know temporary build out there. Yeah. But uh, something Austin didn't have until recently is a scalable outdoor amphitheater, and yeah. we have that now at Waterloo Park. It's called Moody Amphitheater. I yeah. don't know if you've got to check it out. Oh no! Uh, so last year, or I'm sorry, this April of this year, yeah. we threw the first ever Austin Blues Fest, oh, Austin nice. Blues Festival. Yeah. Uh, just a one day, one stage, real simple fest, but yeah. it, the weather was great. It went really well. You know, we had kind of humble beginnings, yeah. just didn't want to uh, get over our skis. Um, but we're expanding it to two days, so it'll be the last weekend of April yeah. of next year, and we're going to be announcing our lineup um, uh, here in just a couple weeks. Oh, excellent! And um, yeah, so I, since this will we'll yeah, put it, yeah, we'll, we'll publicize but it. As expanding well, yeah. to two days, and um, you know, we're we're uh, just kind of taking it one step at a time. But our hope is to, um, you know, it's kind of seemed like something Austin should have, you yeah. know, Austin Blues Festival Absolutely, sounds like yeah. something that like, should exist. Visit for next year. And and of <laughs> course and it allows us to take some of that magic uh that you had that night and take it to a bigger audience. And it also allows us to kind of, you know, we're not we don't take the word blues too 
literally, yeah. uh, you know, kind of like I was saying earlier, we present all types of music, but it's kind of from that origin and yeah. that perspective and style of, you know, the the history of the blues and its its vantage point uh, yeah. in the music universe. And so um, we're uh, excited to, yeah. you know, be able to. So that's April that. next year. April next year, last, next, weekend, of last April, weekend of April. It'll be that Saturday and Sunday okay. at uh, Moody Amphitheater at Waterloo Park. That's a good reason to get out of the cold in Chicago. <laughs> we might come. <laughs> Thanks so much. Please do. Thank you. Thanks.